Max Highlights. And here's your host, Megan Lee. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our Highlights show featuring the best picks of the week. Here's a look at what's coming up. Comic classic French comic strip hero Asterix is back in the 36th edition. Classy fashion, a new book, looks into the popularity of traditional British attire. And classical music star pianist Lang Lang is awarded for his Mozart interpretations. They're back. French comic strip heroes Asterix and Obelix are out and about on a new adventure in the 36th edition of the cartoon. Asterix and the Missing Scroll is the title of the latest comic book. Well, we sat down with the creative team to hear more about it. The latest Asterix comic is the second work by the creative team of artist Didier Conrad and writer Jean-Yves Ferry. Their first collaboration was Asterix and the Picts, published in 2013 to critical acclaim. This time they're introducing a new character, an investigative journalist called Polemics, with a strong resemblance to WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange. We wanted a new character who would be a journalist and a Gaul. We called him Polemics, and right away Didier came up with the idea of using Julian Assange as a reference. The plot is about information, control of information. Julian Assange is an ideal reference because he's internationally well known. He was an obvious inspiration. The new comic sees Julius Caesar penning his own Gallic Wars essays, which chronicle the history of his military campaigns, including his conquest of Gaul. But there's a missing scroll, telling of the small village of indomitable Gauls still holding out against the invaders. The scroll is leaked to the investigative journalist Polemics, who takes it upon himself to reveal the whole story. Asterix goes Wikileaks, as it were. Asterix comics often took their cues from things happening in society. So does this one. Times change, of course. The media change, as does what people and society are interested in. Asterix might be the only comic series that never ages. You can always find ways to make it relevant to the present day. The original team of Albert Oudezo and René Gossigny turned out new adventures for 16 years, until Gossigny's sudden death in 1977. Albert Urduzo soldiered on with more tales of the Gallic village that holds off the Roman legions with a magic potion. The Asterix comics have sold over 365 million copies worldwide and have been translated into 111 languages and dialects. The first Asterix comics appeared over 50 years ago, but one way or another they've still managed to stay modern. For one, because of the style. It's very, very modern, timeless in fact. And the drawing style is still fresh. These comics are like Beatles songs that don't ever seem to grow old. The humor is in the detail. The new volume, for instance, has pigeons as the ancient world's version of Twitter. The first edition of Asterix and the Missing Scroll will run four million copies. That's a lot of confidence the publisher is placing in the creative team. It may be a bit less childish than the last one, Asterix and the Picts, so it'll be interesting to see if people like this more ambitious project, or if they don't like it. Then we'll write an even more elaborate story. The comic has been on Amazon's bestseller list for months. It's safe to say the Gauls will be partying hard at the end. What are some of the common stereotypes when it comes to British fashion? Perhaps 
classic tweeds, plaid or argyle sweaters, a bowler hat, even a cape. Basically, we're talking about classic clothes made to last. And that is the subject of this new book by the German photographer Horst A. Friedrichs. Now, he documented certain British brands and noted the philosophy behind clothes that stand the test of time. Handmade umbrellas or brollies built to last for decades. Brogues that cost 6,000 euros. Bespoke suits made of the finest fabrics. Items made by small businesses robust enough to outlive economic crisis and rise above passing trends. Horst A. Friedrichs tells their story in his book, Best of British. The book isn't just about style, it's about how things are made. I'm actually a photojournalist, and I've always had an interest in factories. As a small boy, I loved visiting factories and taking pictures of the manufacturing process and meeting the workers. Putting together Best of British was an amazing trip. One that took him to St. James Street in London, home to one of the world's oldest hatters, James Lock & Co, established in the 1660s. The shop calls itself the birthplace of the bowler hat, the most British of accessories. Originally meant for the gamekeepers and called the Coke hat, it became known as the bowler because it was designed by London hat makers Thomas and William Bowlers. A well-fitted bowler hat should never pinch. At Locks & Co, master hatters still use a confirmateur to measure the shape of the customer's head and then use a series of century-old techniques to create the perfect tailored hat. The bowler hat is over 160 years old. It's had many famous fans. One of the most loyal was Charlie Chaplin. When you buy a lock bowler, it comes with kind of a lifetime guarantee. So you can bring the hat back and we'll steam it, we'll re-block it, we'll take care of it for you. Um, so it should last a lifetime. All the manufacturers featured in Friedrich's book are at least 100 years old. James Smith & Sons make traditional English umbrellas. Friedrichs has to wait a year for permission to document the production process. The wooden-handled brollies cost up to 3,500 euros. There used to be far more umbrella makers in London. Many shut down in the 1980s. Friedrichs wants to show how much work goes into these handsome handcrafted items and how special the places they're made in are too. In Germany, manufacturing has become very sterile. Here in England and Scotland, we found ourselves opening up drawers that probably hadn't been opened for a hundred years. We found great stuff in those drawers. And, of course, we photographed all of it for the book. The brands he chose to profile are all traditional, pricey and timeless. But that doesn't mean time has stood still for these companies. Scottish raincoat manufacturer Macintosh is now Japanese-owned. Barber now produces much of its outerwear outside the UK to cut costs, though its classic waxed cotton jackets are still made in Britain. Still, fashion journalist Simon Crompton, who wrote the book's text, believes that Britain's garment industry is still in good shape because good old-fashioned craftsmanship is especially in demand. A designer or an owner who is still faithful to the how the product was produced in the first place. I think that's absolutely crucial. Um, what destroys that heritage is if you get an owner, as happens to a lot of Italian brands, who buy it and folks on the design side don't really care about the manufacturing anymore. On London's famous Saville Row, they're dedicated to upholding the art of traditional bespoke tailoring. Royal warrant holders Anderson and Shepherd had their shop here until 2004. But falling demand meant they had to move and downsize. Prince Charles had his suits made here. Anderson and Shepherd used to be an exclusive club. It frowned on marketing and only tailored garments for people who'd received a recommendation from a regular customer. It's that polish, whether it's a leather jacket or a well-worn shoe, it just looks better. Well-made products just get better and look better over time. 
Horst A. Friedrichs ends his tour at a place with plenty of polish, at shoemaker John Lobb. Customers should expect a six-month wait for their custom-made shoes. In the meantime, they can enjoy looking at the lasts from famous customers of bygone days. Friedrich's book isn't just about the best of British apparel. It also contains plenty of personal stories. We want to take a look now at some of the most unique concepts from Dutch Design Week. It's not just about fashion designers showing off their latest ideas. It's also about how technology is playing a greater role in customizing fashion. Our reporter Max Hoffman was on location in the Dutch city of Eindhoven to have a look at the latest trends. This is not the place for lovers of classic design. People who visit Eindhoven for Dutch Design Week want a glimpse of the future, not the past. During the event, the city is brimming with creativity. And one of the hottest places is this little downtown boutique. Martijn van Strien's aim is the ultra-personalization of fashion. The clothes in his post-couture collection are cut to fit the wearer perfectly, and anyone can put them together. I wanted the technique to fill in all of the hard parts and the final assembly to be as simple as a, as an IKEA table, in a sense. And uh, that's why I, th I thought of these connectors. Um, everyone can really easily put this together and, and still create a strong, a strong enough seam to be able to wear the garment. Martijn needs the precise measurements of the wearer for each piece of clothing. In this case, the wearer is Anna Zulman. First, she picks a pattern and a color. Then the designer enters her personal measurements into specially developed software. The final product is supposed to look like this. If it looks like that, I will probably like it a lot, but I'm I do have to see it first, so I want to see it happening, uh, how it works. From data on a USB stick to an actual dress, the model and the designer now need the right hardware. Makerspace, the gallery across the way, has a laser cutter to help designers realize their digital designs. I think technology makes this possible now and not 10 years ago because everyone gets access to 3D printers, laser cutters, uh, and they didn't have that a while ago. Martijn adheres to the open source philosophy. He welcomes anyone to improve his designs online, and he sells them for just five euros. The customer takes the design to the closest maker space. There, using a special polyester fabric, she can have her dress cut. The machine needs six minutes for the front side and six for the back. Combining technology and design has tradition in Eindhoven. Philips used to have its main factory here. Now the old assembly halls are the city's design center. Inside, Paulina van Dongen shows us her designs. She too experiments with ultra-personalized fashion. The show and dress from the 3D printer are tailored to the measurements of the Dutch culture minister. If we can personalize something, if we can make it made to measure, and we can add value during this process, if we can have customers um, uh, share with us their per personal preferences and take part in this design process, I think it will add more value to the clothing. They will cherish it longer. Van Dongen's team has a mission, an end to mass production and throwaway garb. It's incredible. One reason why the culture minister was willing to be a model. Between is the name of the entire outfit. Back in the maker space, the two pieces of polyester have been cut. Now all Martijn has to do is put them together. How he does it is a taste of the future. I think if we use technology in a, in a smart way in production and, and design, we can create a lot more sustainable garments that are more personal, that people have more of a connection with again, without it being as expensive as designer clothing is nowadays. Anne's dress is finished. Making it took less than an hour. First, she makes sure that the fastenings sit properly, and then she's ready to render her final judgment. 
I was a bit skeptical about the fabric, uh, if it would be stiff or more plastic, but it's really soft and comfortable. And I must say that as a woman, I'm always a bit self-conscious about lines or things you see, but it actually, it, it makes me feel very co confident about my uh, appearance. Whether the ultra-personalized designer dress appeals to you or not, it does fit like a glove. Beauty certainly is in the eye of the beholder. All right, well, Chinese pianist Lang Lang shot to international fame in 2008 when he performed at the opening of the Olympic Games in Beijing to an estimated global audience of one billion. Well, since then, he's enjoyed an illustrious career. And now he can add two more awards to his collection after winning at the Echo Classic here in Berlin. Lang Lang was honored as instrumentalist of the year in the piano category for his latest work, the Mozart album, which he recorded together with the Vienna Philharmonic. Well, he described that experience as life-changing. Mozart interpreted by Lang Lang. The 33-year-old Chinese pianist won an award for his album featuring the famous composer's works. Lang Lang teamed up with veteran conductor Nikolaus Hanencourt to produce the Mozart album. It was quite the collaboration, the young piano star and the 85-year-old maestro. DW was on hand to document the meeting of the two musical giants. I learned a lot of things and I also improved in the two years of making Mozart style and, you know, of this incredible sound uh, and articulation that he was inspiring me to do. Yeah. So, so therefore, this recording was a very unique project. The award-winning documentary Mission Mozart tells the story of their collaboration on the album. For four days, the pair was filmed as they performed together with the Vienna Philharmonic at the Wiener Musikverein. Showcasing the ups and downs of rehearsals. The film gives viewers a unique insight into the musician's world. Through this project, you, you know, you hear the response from uh, the great teacher Hanung Kur, you know, and, and the Vienna Philharmonic, and myself, kind of, a, you know, a, a somebody who's trying to really deliver, you know, the Mozart style into the right frame. <laughs> and you really see the process of making, how did it work? Lang Lang started playing the piano at the age of three and won his first contest at five, even if that did entail practicing for six hours a day. His international breakthrough came at the age of 17. In 2013, a DW camera team was again present when he recorded two piano concerts with Sir Simon Rattle and the Berlin Philharmonic. Lang Lang has also branched out into other genres. He's performed with heavy metal band Metallica and for U.S. President Obama at the White House. The Chinese performer truly has become a world star. I really believe that classical music has a, a real power to break through every barrier. Classical music, even though maybe doesn't have the fan base as pop music, but somehow, when you play Mozart, when you play Tchaikovsky, you can play in every corner in the world. Somehow people get it. Over the years, Lang Lang has come to appreciate the support of more experienced musicians. In 2008, he set up his own international music foundation. Its mission is to help up-and-coming musicians via grants, music schools, and joint concerts, and to boost public interest in classical music. 
Lang Lang's commitment also earned him this year's special award at the Echo Gala. Good education changed my career and my life. And I, I'm sure building up a education platform will change lives of others. Lang Lang, a musical phenomenon and an inspiration for the next generation. Beautiful. All right, finally, the part of the show I like best when we get a sneak peek into someone's humble abode. And today it's a townhouse in the Portuguese capital, Lisbon. Now, what's interesting about this space is that it's an ultra modern structure tucked in between the city's more classically designed buildings. Well, the proud owner was kind enough to invite us in for a look around. In Lisbon, the Portuguese capital, historic buildings dominate the cityscape. Some are several hundred years old, but here, nestled between two older buildings, there's a modern one with a facade made from local marble-like limestone. The building was designed by architect Jose Mateus. Hello, my name is Jose Mateus. This is my house, and I'm going to take you to a visit through it. Mateus and his family moved in in 2013. The building boasts 430 square meters of living space, divided over five floors. A narrow hallway leads straight to the living room. Well, the house was uh, created for a family with three kids. It's a, it's a family with a cosmopolitan life, a very informal way of life, and a family with many friends that is used to, to organize parties and to bring people into the house. The furnishings needed to be functional, so they could be moved around at any time. The ceilings, floors, and walls are made of exposed concrete. You can cover it with uh, colorful uh, materials, paintings, furniture, that gives to this, uh, let's say, more or less cold material a, a, a more warm sensation. And you don't need to pay for painting or plastering. The combined kitchen and dining area covers about 50 square meters. It's on the lower level. This part of the house was designed by the architect's wife. Many times the kitchen is too small for people to meet, for example, during parties. And in this case, the idea was to create an overall space that connects intensively with the garden. The garden is small, but it's a peaceful oasis in the heart of the city. Outside you can find the existing walls that are really old and you can understand how they were built. And you can see, for example, here on the, on the, on the floor where I am, the, the, the old stones that were taken from the demolished house. That building housed several apartments. It was quite run down when Mateusz first saw it in 2010. He tore it down and built the townhouse in its place. Unlike in most private dwellings, the house's seven rooms spread over five floors are all built on top of one another. So the residents make a lot of trips up and down stairs. Many people think this house is uncomfortable because we have to climb steps all the time. Well, it's a townhouse with uh, different floors, so it needs stairs. Uh, this house has four stairs. But uh, what we found out is that daily life is concentrated in two or three floors only. And at the same time, we feel that somehow it's uh, healthy to climb steps. Their son's bedroom is located on the first floor. The wall behind the bed also serves as a clothes cupboard. On the top floor, there's a patio. And across the way, there's a library. Jose Mateus spends a lot of time up here. No matter what the weather, there's a wonderful view over Lisbon and the Tagus River. This vista was the reason that he made his home so tall. 
I love this view is because it has always new details, always new colors, if it's early in the morning, if it's uh, late in the evening, and it's something that it's never the same. For Jose Mateos, it's always worth climbing the stairs to look out over Lisbon from the top of his modern townhouse. And that wraps up our highlight show from me and the rest of the, of the crew here in Berlin. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you again soon.